What I want to do in this lecture is to take up the philosophy of George Barclay. As many of you know, having read the section on Barclay, he can be an incredibly difficult philosopher to understand. And I'm somewhat shocked that the <clears throat> author of our textbook um, decided to include Barclay simply because he is so abstract and difficult to comprehend what he is um, what he's talking about here and what he's trying to get at in his philosophy. So in light of that, I think it's appropriate that I put together a brief um, audio lecture here on Barclay, and hopefully we can uncover what he's getting at and maybe more importantly what he's not saying. It's real easy to confuse Barclay and to, and to misrepresent him. Okay, so let's take a few minutes and let's try to uncover what Barclay is getting at here. So I got his dates up here on the screen. You can see 1685 to 1753. He's an Anglo-Irish philosopher. Okay, so he's the only philosopher um, from Ireland that we're going to study in this course. Later in life, he became bishop in the Anglican Church, and he's commonly referred to as Bishop Barclay. Okay, because he was a bishop in the Anglican Church. Barclay published on many topics, including books on vision, motion, mathematics, and theology. Of course, being a bishop, theology would have been of primary interest to him. Barclay is also known as one of the three great British empiricists. Thus far, we've looked at Hume, but prior to Hume, there were two other very important British empiricists, namely John Locke and Bishop Barclay himself. Barclay's best-known work on epistemology, the theory of knowledge, is his treatise concerning the principles of human knowledge published in 1710. And one of the primary concerns of Barclay is the threat of materialism and skepticism. So to define materialism very broadly, we could say it's the view that reality consists of nothing but matter. That all reality is reducible to, to physical properties. Basically, reality can be reduced to matter itself. Well, as a bishop within the Anglican Church, this would obviously be a major concern to, to George Barclay. And it's one of the primary concerns that led him to develop his philosophy the way that he did, this threat of materialism. Well, I mean, we can tell from the definition of materialism that if that is true, what would that say about God, who's traditionally been understood to be an invisible spirit? Right? If all reality is material, that would tend to say that at least God wouldn't exist as we have traditionally understood him to exist, right? as this all-powerful, immaterial, invisible being. The second threat that Barclay sees is skepticism. So given the epistemology of John Locke, Barclay sees philosophy heading down a route towards skepticism, where philosophers aren't very confident in our ability to understand reality. And again, coming at it from the perspective of a bishop in the Anglican Church, Barclay would obviously be very concerned about that. I mean, to say that we can't know certain things, that would seem to be an attack on the belief in God, or maybe an attack on the knowledge of the immortality of the soul. The threat of materialism and skepticism are surely first and foremost on the mind of Barclay here as he develops his philosophy. And you can read more about his biography. The textbook does a pretty decent job um, given us some historical facts about him. Okay, so what does it mean to exist? Well, Barclay is classified as a subjective idealist. 
So let's first take up the word idealism. Broadly speaking, idealism is the view that reality is mind dependent. Right, that reality itself is a product of an immaterial mind. Barclay is known as a subjective idealist because he thinks that reality is ultimately a product of su subjects. So reality consists of finite or created minds. God would be an infinite mind for Barclay. But our minds, our finite minds, would also be included in that, as well as different ideas, thoughts and feelings and sensations that our finite minds have. So physical reality, according to subjective idealism, does not exist apart from the subject or the mind who perceives that physical reality. And subjective idealism is typically contrasted with objective idealism, which still holds that reality is mind-dependent, but it's objective in the sense that reality exists independently of finite human minds. The textbook gives a pretty good uh, definition of both of those terms, so I highly recommend that you... Um, that you read over that in the introduction to Barclay. Okay, so what does it mean to exist? Well, sensible things, according to Barclay, do not and cannot exist independently of being perceived. So because Barclay is an idealist, perception will play a very big role in his philosophy. So for example, in the reading that we have for this week. Barclay uses the example of a table. And he says that <clears throat> if one were to claim that the table exists, that is essentially to say that the table is perceived or is perceivable. So one of the things Barclay is going to say is that all sensations are ideas. Now, it's interesting here and somewhat paradoxical because Barclay viewed himself as a common-sense empiricist, someone who is going to return empiricism back to its, its common-sense roots that he thought Locke had somehow deviated from. Well, then we hear him saying that sensible things do not exist independently of being perceived, and it kind of makes us wonder here what he's getting at. I mean... On the surface, this would appear to be anything but common sense. But anyhow, Barclay argues that for something to exist, ultimately it has to be perceived by some mind, either a finite human mind or the divine mind, what we would know as God. There's really no way to think of the table as existing, he argues, except by thinking of someone perceiving it. How else would we prove that a table exists? However, as he points out, and I'll quote him here, he writes, Let it not be said that I take away existence. I only declare the meaning of the word so far as I can comprehend it. So what Barclay is getting at here is, when we say that something exists, whether it's a table, a chair, a car, a horse, whatever, Ultimately, we have to fall back upon this idea of perception. I mean, how else would the statement the table exists make sense if we were not to involve perception? So you walk into a room, you see a table, you're confident that that particular table exists because you have a perception of it. Okay, so existence for Barclay, we can see at this early point, is going to be tied together with perception. This leads to Barclay's famous formulation, Essay est percepi, 